be reading out of 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 10. And it is with me, brothers and sisters, when I come to you, I do not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came with you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have, been, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Thank you, Tyler. That was a great job of reading that scripture, that's for sure. So that is the scripture for today. We're not going to preach on the whole thing, but I'll preach on part of it. Yes, I'm deviating from Matthew for one Sunday. No other reason than it caught my eye and spoke to me. That was the reason why I deviated. So I'm preaching on it today. So let's do a little background on the church in Corinth. <clears throat> when Paul wrote this letter, Corinth was a church that was in spiritual trouble. They, they, uh, Corinth was a pagan city. And they were off course as a church. In reality, they thought they were super spiritual. They thought that they had arrived at perfection. Paul had to pull them up short. If you ever pulled up somebody short by the lapels, that's what Paul was doing in this letter. He was pulling them up short by the, by the lapels, and he did a heart check and a health check on their church. It is reported to him that there were divisions and factions among them. You know what the division was about? Who baptized who? That's kind of crazy, but that's what it was. What it meant to them is, I've, if I was baptized by Paul, I was more spiritual than if I was baptized by Apollos. You know? So that's the kind of thing that was going on. They were misusing the communion. <clears throat> the wealthy among them arrived at church. They would have a meal before they did their communion service. And the wealthy people could afford to bring more food, but they didn't share it. They would, they would uh, eat up the food before the blue-collar working-class people got there, and there wasn't much left to eat. The poor got off work. They found nothing at all. There was rampant sexual sin that wasn't being dealt with by the church. Instead, they almost reveled in it. They were taking one another to court and lawsuits instead of dealing with the disputes in a house. Top it all off, they were questioning Paul's credentials as an apostle, saying that he was mighty in letter, but he wasn't very mighty in person. In all, Paul spent 18 months in Corinth when the church was founded. He had just gotten a report from close people saying, I'm talking about the divisions within the church, Paul laid a sure foundation of the word, but others had compromised the structure, the building of the church by divisions and factions. Always amazed me how fast a church can slip into apostasy. This was still in the time of the apostles, and already they were getting off track. So I've entitled this message, not the same as what's in your bulletin, What Foundation Are You Building On? That's the title of the message today. So as Paul addresses these issues in this letter, and it's believed to possibly be the second letter that was uh, sent to the church, the first one didn't survive time, he begins this chapter defending the message that was brought to them by saying his message did not come by superiority <clears throat> of wisdom or superiority of speech, but in the power of God and the Holy Spirit. 
You know, one of the greatest revivals that happened a couple centuries ago. I'm sitting up here with a weak voice, and I'm reminded of this guy. He wrote in, a, he read in a monotone voice, and held his scripture up this high, and people were falling over in the aisles. It was a great revival. It started with that message. Paul wants to see a healthy church. That's what his purpose in writing this letter is. In, in chapter 1, verses 18 to 19, Paul tells us about the foolishness of God's wisdom <clears throat> compared to man's wisdom. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The word of the cross. Who would ever think that the cross would be the way to victory? Normally you will come with a mighty warrior. Normally you will come with a king. On a horse and an army, Jesus came to the cross to save the world. He didn't come as a warrior. He came as a suffering servant. When one should expect a conquering king. But in God's wisdom, it's always funny when I get my notes mixed up. <laughs> The cross is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The church in Corinth should have been operating in godly wisdom, but instead Paul found they were operating in the flesh. Paul addresses this in chapter 3 as he gets on the church for not being mature, but infants in Christ. This is a couple years after the church was founded. Let's read what he says. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, but you were not yet ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not being mere men? What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I upon Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. <clears throat> He chides them for their attitude of superiority in 1 Corinthians 4, 8 to 13. And he really gets sarcastic with them here. You are already filled. You have become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. For I think God has exhibited us as apostles last of all. Men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but are strong. you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor to this present hour. We are poorly clothed, roughly treated, and are homeless. We toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even till now. Not a happy life for an apostle. But yet, today, so much of the church is preaching health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. I think Paul would roll over in his grave if he heard such teaching. But you can hear something coming out of this that is so important for us. His love for the church. He loved the church so much and he desired the church to be healthy. It should be the goal of every church, and our church as well, to be a healthy church. Not be rife with factions, but become a healthy church. Next issue Paul addresses was immorality. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 5.1 what the issue was. It was actually reported that there is immorality among you. 
an immorality of a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles. Someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. Now, I'm afraid there's a lot more rampant immorality in the church today that is embraced, not, not taken care of. That would make this church pale in comparison. From the open embracing of the same-sex relationships to the acceptance of cohabitation, worship of goddesses, it runs the gamut. Sin that the church embraces rather than removed from their midst. If you have sin in your life, get rid of it. It'll destroy you, guaranteed. Paul addressed it in this way in verse 3. And I would hate to bend the person that he talked that this letter was addressed to. I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Wow. I don't think I would ever do that to anybody myself. But he did. It seems really harsh, but it had the intended effect. The person who was mentioned uh, repented in tears and he's received back into the fellowship of the church. And that's the best possible outcome. 2 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, so that the contra on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such one might be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. The man was reestablished into the church again. Discipline had done its work. Third issue was taking another, one another to court. Chapter 6. Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you and you are not competent to constitute even the smallest law courts, do you know we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life he goes on to say, better to be defrauded or wrong than to go to the courts. On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your own brethren. Well, what's the takeaway for this? Takeaway is we should live to a higher standard than that. There shouldn't be a reason that we have to take one another to court. We should live to a higher standard than that. Always loving, always forgiving rather than being spiteful and disagreeable. The final thing that the church in Corinth did was misuse the communion. <clears throat> and I talked about that a little bit already. It wasn't their only misdeed. There are issues concerning marriage, use of spiritual gifts, and lots of other things we could talk about. But look at it this way. It is such a blessing that this was a troubled church for us because we get some really good teaching as a result of uh, you know, Paul having to correct their misdeeds. And so we get some really clear teaching in all these subjects. If you read through 1 Corinthians, there's some really good teaching there. 1 Corinthians 11, 20 to 22. Therefore, when you eat together, it is not the Lord's Supper, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. And one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat or drink? You know what the Lord's Supper is supposed to be? An act of worship, an act of remembrance. It is supposed to be uh, commemorating the Lord's death, not a, not a, a feast and an orgy. What they were, or not an orgy, but a drinkathon, whatever they were doing. Paul says, don't you have houses to eat or drink in? Or you despise those who have nothing. So you can see their lack of compassion for one another in this church. Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you, he says. As in every church, there are those who have means and those who don't have much. Apparently those who are wealthy and could bring a big meal and a lot of food, ate it up and got drunk before those who had had to work to get there. William Barclay in his commentary says, there was class sectarianism in the church. 
The wealthy were not concerned for the poor and the needy. That's a sad commentary. We should always be concerned about the, uh, those who are poor amongst us or have little means to provide food for themselves. Paul admonished them to do their eating and drinking at home and make the Lord's Supper an act of worship and repentance. You know, that's what we want to do here. When you come to the Lord's Supper, he says, you need to repent of your sins. You need to turn away from You need to ask for forgiveness. So and we've seen the worldly wisdom of the church. Now I have to look at some of the uh, uh, <clears throat> godly wisdom that Paul wants us to take in. So in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul tells the church, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come in superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimonies of God. One of the things that was popular in the cities in Corinth and Athens as well was debate, philosophical debate. Any new idea that came along, they wanted to they'd spend their whole day debating certain issues or certain things. And Corinth was one of those churches. And so the, the, in, in chapter uh, 1, verse 20, Paul addresses this. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? The world and all of its wisdom has not found their way to salvation through Jesus Christ. That only comes through the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. The world and its wisdom has said there is no God. The Bible says only the fool says in his heart there is no God. The fool, and, uh, the world says there's only evolution. There is no God not creation. Paul's an authority as an apostle is challenged in the church in Galatia. The problem with the church in Galatia, and I'm kind of jumping books here, but the problem with the church in Galatia was that the Judaizers had come down from Jerusalem and told the church in Galatia that they had to keep the law as well as believe in Jesus Christ, and specifically circumcision. And Paul gets on them in chapter 3, Galatians 3, 1 to 5. And he chastises them for mixing religions, which is called syncretism, following another gospel, which is really no gospel at all. And there's a lot of that out there in, in, in the world today, mixing of different religions. People like a smorgasbord. They want a smorgasbord of religion as well. I'll pick this from this one, I like that. I'll pick this from that, I like that. I'll pick this from this one. No, Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified? What he meant was this. When they heard the gospel the first time, and Jesus was uh, portrayed to them as crucified on the cross, it was portrayed so powerfully. It was like they were there standing in front of the cross witnessing this going on. They weren't there, but it was portrayed to them that powerfully. The gospel had gone forth that powerful and had overwhelmed them and they when they received Christ. <clears throat> the impact was dramatic. They were probably cut to the quick as they received Christ as their Savior, much like it did in, uh, on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached and 3,000 people got saved. The men were cut to the quick. He said, brothers, what shall we do? We crucified the Messiah. Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these Judaizers had come down from Jerusalem and told them that believing in Jesus was okay, but they had to keep the law. Paul responds in verses 2 and 3. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? The Judaizers were telling them they had to be circumcised, keep the law, keep the feasts. Verses 4 and 5. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with spirit and works, miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? How do we know what is true and what is false? How do we know? How are we able to be discerning in what is true and what is false? 
There's plenty of false teachers out there. By being in the Word of God daily. Once you know the truth, it's pretty hard to be deceived by a lie. Back to 1 Corinthians 2, 3, and 5. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with powerful preaching. That's not what Paul is saying. What he's saying is that it wasn't that the gospel that we believe in wasn't built on man's wisdom, but on God's wisdom. <clears throat> if you've ever had experience in a construction trade, and some of you do, you know how important a strong and, and stable foundation is to the survival of any building. It's the same for the church. Without the sure foundation of the word of God, a church crumbles. Cracks appear in the walls and soon the entire building is compromised. In closing, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11, according to the grace of God that was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That is really the reason for the whole letter. The foundation must be the Word of God. The foundation of this church must be the Word of God, or it'll crumble. There was a beautifully decorated home, only two years old. When, when and this person says, when we purchase it, I don't know who wrote this. It seemed ideal for us at this, at this stage in our lives. We bought it after the second viewing. As per standard procedure, we hired an inspector to ensure all was well. When we read the report, we were quite astonished. There was a problem with two of the footings. Footings are the support base or groundwork of a structure that are extremely important in the support of the house. <coughs> Excuse me. It seems like the code had been met. Cement pads have been poured every eight feet and support being placed thereon. The problem surfaced when we realized that the beams did not line up with the main support beams for the first and second floor. So there was no support for the first and second floor, and the house was starting to crumble. As time would elapse, the floor would sag and buckle, the walls would crack, and the weight of the house would be too much to bear without proper support. Something would have to give. Those support beams in the crawl space of the house were just in the wrong place, even though they passed code. We hired someone to correct this situation. It was an unforeseen expense and a headache. But just like those beams, our life can be appear to be in cold <coughs> when we do good deeds, act charitable, and go to church. In truth, we can be off-center, just like those support beams were. If our footings of our life are not grounded in God, the eventual weight of living in this world can be cause us to crumble and fail. Proper support stems with the correct foundation. There's an old hymn that says, Church is one foundation. It is Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> she is the new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Church is one foundation. We must allow Jesus to be the footings in our lives. With him... We will celebrate the joys of this life and be able to face the adversities which come our way without crumbling. How many of you have faced adversities in your life? How many of you are depending on Jesus to carry you through all those adversities? It's not when they will, if they will come, it's when they come. Adversity will come our way. But if our foundation is built on the Word of God, our lives are are run according to the word of God, then we have a good foundation to stand on. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us today. There's so much more that could be said. But Lord, just uh, just bless this word you've given us today in Second in First Corinthians chapter 2 and, and know that our foundation has to be you. So Lord, now as we close off this message and begin to uh, uh, close our service, May your name be glorified. May our foundation be sure in you. 
We will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.